have to go down to Caltech tomorrow morning, and in the evening I have to give a speech. It's our hundredth uh, birthday of Richard Feynman. He won't be there, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, every so often is another birthday for Richard Feynman. They have these huge events, public events, big public events, and I'm usually asked to, uh, to speak at them. But the day before yesterday, I realized I hadn't prepared anything. And I went back and I started to prepare. And I realized after about two and a half hours of preparing that I had written exactly the same thing that I had said, I don't know how many years ago it was, I said it. <laughs> how many things are there to say about somebody? And, uh, I said exactly the same things. It's on the internet, it's a TED uh, thing. And I can't go back and do the same thing again. So today I woke up in the morning and I started preparing again. And it basically took me all day. And this is all by way of excuse about uh, why I'm unprepared. Will you drink this time? Hmm? Will you drink, drink alcohol this time while you, while you give the talk? Uh, <laughs> if I feel time. like my blood sugar is low, yes. <laughs> no, I had um, I had some bad experiences and things like that. Nobody else knows but me. But um, bad experiences giving uh, big public lectures where my blood sugar went low. I don't have I'm not diabetic. I'm the opposite. I have um, sort of hypoglycemia. I don't know if it's, I don't even think it's a technical thing, but my blood sugar goes low. And man, that can be deadly when you're in the middle of a lecture. So I asked my doctors about it. They said, eat sugar. Now, I eat sugar, eat something sugary beforehand. Uh, Savas had a wonderful experience with the same thing. He has the same problem. And uh, so one time he, he, he was supposed to give a big lecture. You ask him about it. I don't think I was there. And he, loaded up on sugar to a point where um, it can also have an effect on you. And I think I don't remember what the story was exactly. I don't remember if he fell asleep during his own talk or he went to sugar shock or insulin shock or something. So I tried sugar. It sure didn't work. It didn't, Chocolate. Uh, hmm? Chocolate. Yeah, it didn't work. It, it was, it was a, um, it just wasn't right. It didn't work. So I was talking to uh, somebody else, I don't remember who, and said, beer. Beer is the thing. <laughs> and indeed, beer is the thing. It works like a charm. Oh, I, I know it. Yeah. I don't, I don't normally do this before I lecture, sugar or anything else. But in the middle of the lecture, I suddenly feel like I'm going down. I want something that will bring it up really fast. <laughs> Okay, probably whiskey would work even faster, but <laughs> So, whenever I do these things, I make sure I have a beer in front of me. Now, the last time I did this at Caltech, nobody had it, and there was no place to get a beer, but somebody had a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> I didn't use it. Uh, I pretended I did, but I didn't. Oh, you did it? No. But beer, is, beer gets into you real fast, and it, uh, it does the trick. We should get you a little flask, Lenny. Yeah. No, it wasn't, no, no, it wasn't a flask. So I went up on the stage with a flask. <laughs> Somebody saw it, and I had to fess up before I lectured. Yeah, I drink to my friend Feynman. <laughs> Um, last time, I spoke a little bit about um, complexity geometry and uh, set up a, oh, I guess uh, I should wait for a moment. Is that right? No. Oh, I don't know. Uh, oh, I'll wait for did you turn it on? I, yeah. It is right now. Pushed it. Oh, it's running. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Separate kind of out of it. <laughs> Sort of captured all my excuses. <laughs> <laughs> and your advice for giving talks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it was not a 
advice. <laughs> All right, we talked about we we talked about um, complexity geometry, and I outlined for you. I didn't do the calculation. It's fun to do. It's easy to do, and um, it's uh, worked out in some detail in. Uh, the paper and Adam and I wrote about the second law of complexity. The basic calculation consists of taking two neighboring Hamiltonians and evolving them so as to uh, sweep out trajectories in, in what, in SU2 to the N, sweep out neighboring trajectories, and then calculate the geodesic calculate the curvature of the section to find where those two trajectories. The section means the collection of all geodesics which are made by linear combinations of the two Hamiltonians. So that's the section associated with those, with, uh, those two Hamiltonians. And the sectional curvature is, by definition, the curvature at, let's call it the origin, the tangent plane where those uh, trajectories are emanating out of. So it's really strictly a local thing. It's not calculating the curvature of the whole global slice. It's calculating the curvature at the point. You can do it anywhere as on a manifold, but doing it anywhere as on a manifold is not the same as doing it for a particular section as a function of how far you are from the, from the origin. So, the calculation was done, and it yields a curvature which depends on the penalty factors. The penalty factors that I call script I, or whatever I call them, the penalty factors which were functions of the weights of the operators uh, in the Hamiltonian. Well, not in the Hamiltonian, but the weights of the operators uh, defining, uh, defining directions in the space. Okay, so as long as the weights increase at a rate which is, which is faster than a certain rate, or just as long as they increase a little bit faster than, uh, uh, I forgot what the number was, uh, as long as they increase at a, at, a, at a rate of something or other, uh, the curvature comes out negative. This was something that was known to Michael Nielsen but he sort of over his his penalty factors were enormous overkill factors, uh, and with more rational, reasonable, less draconian penalty factors, the the curvature is typically generically negative as long as the penalty factors increase fast enough. Uh, but that's the curvature at the uh, at the origin of the manifold. Now. Uh, the origin of the section. Now, Adam and I calculated it beyond that. And I'll tell you what happened and why we don't think it's right, why, it's, why we don't think it's the right thing. There's a picture out there in the hall. Has anybody seen it of a sort of knitted, knitted, uh, what's it? it's out there on the far wall. It's a picture of somebody knitted, knitted, you know, like, you know what knitting means, you know what knitting means. <laughs> A, math, a math, math, mathematician who likes to knit knitted a negatively curved space embedded in a negatively curved two-dimensional space embedded in three dimensions. And if you look at it, you go out there, you'll see that it, well, it's very, very complicated and it grows in a very, very complex way of, uh, of almost space filling. In fact, it does become space filling, three-dimensional space filling flops all over the place with wildly uh, varying and tremendously large extrinsic curvatures. Okay. Um, that space does not have a very high intrinsic curvature, but the way it's embedded in three-dimensional space is so complicated that it gets a huge extrinsic curvature. And that's kind of what we found when we tried to do the, uh, the calculation uh, which I think was the wrong way to do the calculation of what we really wanted. So I'll just tell you a little bit about what the right, what I think the right calculation is away from the origin. The calculation at the origin was correct. The, uh, the sectional curvature is negative and does 
indicate some kind of geodesic uh, deviation. But I'll try to give you a little idea. Okay, well, let me just uh, draw it. So. Okay. Here's the origin, and through that origin, we have all the geodesics which are generated by linear combinations of two Hamilton means, I think, which I called H and delta. As I said, delta didn't mean a difference. It just was another, uh, another letter of, uh, of the alphabet, of the Greek alphabet in this case. And you just take the space span, or the space generated by all of those geodesics. It's a two-dimensional surface of some sort. And you try to calculate its curvature. Now, this is not too hard. Actually, this is not terribly hard. But you can estimate it in the following way. The metric had in it, well, it had this d omega, d omega, and then it had these penalty factors, i which were functions of the weight of the operators. The weights of the operators, um, uh, the weights of the operators, the directions characterizing the omegas here. And this was the kind of metric uh, that we were talking about. We calculated the sectional curvature of it. These i's here, we could write this in another way. We could write this, since, since the i that I used was entirely diagonal, um, we could write the omega as a function of the weight of the direction. The omegas are, are directions in the space, the omegas, or the defined directions. This is a direction of weight, W. Everybody know what weight means? Weight means the number of basic uh, qubits in the, uh, in the operators. The omega and some sort of I of omega. The most important factor in calculating how the metric grows, because we expected this thing to grow exponentially with W, grow too fast with W, the most important factor is this factor here, and we were talking, remember what we were talking about, we were talking about a precursor operator and the growth of a precursor operator, and one can estimate how fast the weights of a precursor operator increase as a function of time. The radial direction here is just time, the revolving Hamiltonians of time, and you can calculate the i of omega we speculated was of the form roughly 4 to the or i of w, 4 to the w. And now you can ask how fast, as you move away from the origin, um, the precursor operator along any one of these directions here, how fast, or any pair of directions, how fast the, um, the weights of operators increase. And that's known. Anybody know the answer? It's in a paper by uh, someone who's not here today, but is sometimes here. Douglas, Dan, um, Roberts, and uh, Alex computed how the typical weights of a precursor increase with time, and that's supported to the time. So that means that the characteristic i's in here grow like 4 to the e to the time. If put into the calculation, if really stirred into the calculation the right way, what it implies is that the theta theta d theta, the theta theta components of the metric of this um, geometry, this, uh, the radial direction, which I call time, and there's the, uh, the uh, angular direction, which I call theta, these things will grow as e to the 4 to the W, which is crazy. And it's an incredibly rapid growth. Uh, it's, how would you expect, incidentally, a space of uniform curvature? What about a space of uniform curvature? How would you think it may increase? The hyperbolic plane. Exponential. Like a cinch. Like a cinch. It would just be a cinch. Right? Single exponential. This is double exponential here. This double exponential means, if, what it actually means is if you calculate the curvature itself, 
the curvature will increase, not this fast, the curvature will increase like a simple, like a simple exponential. All right, now, is that the right thing to compute? It's not really, here's the reason. What's happening is this, this manifold spanned by these uh, geodesics here, moving out, out from this point, is behaving very much like that knitted hyperbolic plane. It's flopping and flopping and flopping and flopping and getting wildly extrinsically curved. Or at least that's what we think is happening. All right, so let me take, let me take two neighboring geodesics, yeah. which differ by some small angle. How much of an angle? Yeah. So why don't we just compute everything in terms of, say, like Riemann and Ricci's, like all in terms of intrinsic curvature? What, what are we missing there? Nothing. Probably nothing. Probably nothing. Uh, no, no, I think, it's, I think this is a doable thing. Oh, no, 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 there is a reason. I believe we correctly calculated the, um, the curvature of this space, which is made out of these radial geodesics coming. I don't think we did that wrong. And I think it does grow this way, doubly exponential. Yeah, it's just the wrong surface. And I'll try to show you why. What's happening, you take two geodesics, what we really want to do is calculate a precursor. A precursor corresponds not strictly speaking to starting at a point in radioactive geodesics going out, but starting with a little interval. That little interval could correspond to the W operator uh, that you're evolving, and then evolving outward from these two points. Something like that. In other words, what we really want to calculate is the growth of the operator E to the minus i h t w e to the i h t. There actually is a relationship between this and the Loschmidt operator. Uh, this is closely connected to the Loschmidt operator between a Hamiltonian and another Hamiltonian plus a small perturbation times w. They're almost the same thing. But the rule is you want w to correspond to a non non-zero length. W should correspond to a complexity of about one. Or about one. What that corresponds to, uh, you don't have to take my word for it, you, you can work it out, but, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you what it, what it actually corresponds to is putting a little bit of an angle between neighboring geodesics where the angle is itself of order one over n, one over n, one over k, one over the number of qubits. That's the thing we should really do is to put a small angle in here. And then what is it we want to calculate? We want to calculate as we move away, we want to calculate the length of the smallest, well, of the geodesic connecting these two points. That's different than what I did over here, and I'll show you why. I'll try to show you why. Let's I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of try to flatten this. Well, I didn't do very much. I flattened it out with the um, secondary check. What happens, or at least what we think happens, is the surface actually generated, literally generated by the continuum of geodesics through here, we think looks something like this. These directions in the surface grow, the distance along them grows very, very quickly. It's double exponential. It's growing sort of like that, uh, like that crazy knitted um, hyperbolic plane. Uh, whereas what we really want to calculate is not the length along that surface, but the length along the surface spanned, the, length, the, the surface generated by the geodesics between these two things here. Yeah. They're different things. In fact, 
the geodesics between these don't actually lie in the surface span by the, uh, by the, the congruence of geodesics here. And the one thing you can be sure of is that the geodesic length from here to here is less than, uh, than this thing here. So our guess, it was also the guess that, um, that uh, Douglas put forward, is that as you move away from here, the space gets so floppy that, uh, that the, the surface span by the geodesics gets so floppy that it just overestimates by a lot the geodesic lengths these two best points as you move out. Um, exactly how you go about calculating is what you want to do. You want to take, again, two geodesics separated by an angle of order 1 over n. And now you literally want to calculate how the geodesic length between these grows. Geodesics will tend to look something like this. So you want to pick the same sort of parameterization along both geodesics? And then along the, yeah, that's right. You want to fix the time, the same time along the geodesics. Yeah. But these will be shortcuts relative to, uh, yeah. relative to this. And um, that's all very well determined. And our guess from some experiences, uh, well, uh, our guess in order to fit the way we expect complexity to behave, but to be honest, it's a guess based on, it's a wishful guess based on what we hope happens, okay? What we hope happens is that we'll find the curvature on here to be more or less constant, approximately constant, out to a distance comparable to the scrambling distance. If that can be shown, then we would have a, a deeper understanding of how complexity grows. But that looks hard. Well, I don't know how hard it is. Um, you say you know somebody who knows all about left invariant metrics. <laughs> Adam tried to work it out for one qubit. It was too hard. So he put something on the internet. What is this um, uh, overflow thing? Was Stack it called? Stack exchange. Hmm? Stack, Stack exchange or whatever it is. Math overflow. And one mathematician said it's trivial and easy. Another mathematician said it's absolutely impossible, too hard to calculate. <laughs> <laughs> the one that said it was trivial was wrong. <laughs> so, so my guess is it's quite tractable but you just have to sit down and think hard um, how, to, how basically how to, given, given two Hamiltonians, H and H plus delta, <coughs> how to parameterize the geodesics along here and then feed that into the metric, the, um, the metric here, and actually calculate. So that's, that's for somebody to do. I think it's... Uh, I think it's a good calculation, I mean, it doesn't mean I'm going to do it. Okay. I will make the assumption that the curvature doesn't get wildly out of control and that it stays more or less constant, at least not for the scrambling, uh, the scrambling. Okay, so then comes the question. We've constructed this um, complexity metric, which whose distances along it um, tend to reflect how many gates or how much uh, how many gates it takes to go from one state to another, to, from one unitary operator to another. Um, how exactly, in terms of that metric, defined in this way, should we define the complexity? Now, the obvious answer, and that was the answer of Nielsen, is let's call it the relative complexity of two uh, unitary operators, is just the smallest geodesic length between them. Of course, in general, there can be more than one geodesic connecting uh, points. 
So the smallest geodesic between them would be defined to be the, uh, the complexity. Uh, I think that's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think there's a more elegant answer that seems to fit more nicely with a number of things, uh, well, with a number of things, which in some sense is equivalent. In some sense is equivalent. It's the least action of a particle moving on this space with a Lagrangian, which is just the second order Lagrangian of geodesics on the space. So let me just remind you what that is. If you want to calculate geodesic geodesics on a Riemannian space, there are two ways to do it. They are equivalent. You start with the metric. Let's call it. Let's call it G N N D X M D X N. These are just arbitrary coordinates in the space, okay? and G M N is whatever metric uh, we're interested in. Okay, so one way is just to calculate. Uh, it's just to calculate L length of the geodesic is just, um, or the length of any curve. It's just given by the square root of this. And that's fine. It's just, I guess it's called, what is it called? The first order action? Okay. And it will give you the length. And if you minimize it, if you minimize it, or which equivalently solve the equations of motion for an action which looks like this, that action or the action which looks like this, that will be the geodesic length, strictly the geodesic length. Yes, sir, did you want to? Um, this is possibly a stupid question, but so we're thinking about classical motion on this space? Yes, are absolutely. We going, we're, are we ever going to quantize the no. motion on this space? No. I don't so, know, if there, maybe there's some reason to about it. Right. So, so for now, it's just literally moving around on, in this space? Yeah, it's just following the, the evolution of unitary operators on the space of unitary operators. So it's a completely classical problem. The other way is to introduce a time coordinate. We call it tau, tau, and to use this action here. This is the second order action. Okay. It will also generate geodesics on the space. But this one is not reparameterization, time reparameterization. The previous one, if we wrote it in the form integral square root, g, dx, dx, we put a b tau here and a b tau here and then a b tau outside, that is reparameterization invariant. This is not reparameterization invariant, and it's only for some specific gauge fixed parameterization for tau that this will equal this. Okay. But if you do make that uh, specification, and I'll, we'll do it, if you do make that spe specification, these two are in fact equal. So it doesn't matter, if done right, whether you use the first order or the second order, and the second order looks a hell of a lot more like a um, a standard Lagrangian with no square roots in it and so forth. And it's much, much easier to work with than do canonical formalism and so forth. Um, the Lagrangian would be this, that's L. And it's also the energy, not the true energy of the quantum system, but the analog or the auxiliary, auxiliary energy of this system is just kinetic energy. There is no potential energy, it's just kinetic energy. And so this here represents, if you like, a um, mechanical system, non-relativistic particle moving on a curved surface of very high dimension. The motion is geodesic. And um, for an appropriate gauge fixing of tau here, it will generate the lengths of the geodesics. Okay, so 
uh, but we can do things either way. First order or second order. Notice that in doing things second order, we really are specifying physically, in some sense, what uh, a, a scale for tau. With all of the definitions that we've used and so forth, this tau would be the, we're going to fix this tau to be the clock time of the computer that's running. The clock time of the computer that's running, or the, in the uh, circuit model of complexity, we just divide circuits up into time intervals. In each time interval, how many uh, gates take place? Of what a k, of what are the number of uh, qubits? So, what I mean by the clock time is the time that it takes for the complexity to increase by an amount proportional to the number of qubits. There are many, many different ways we've thought about this. We look at Rindler time. Rindler time has the property that the complexity grows roughly one gate per qubit per unit time. That's one definition of what it might mean. Same thing here, of order one gate per qubit per unit time interval. And I'll think of that as the clock time of the computer. The computer is running in this parallel kind of circuit where everybody gets to interact once. And if you compare that with this, here's what, this. And we want to say that length, oh sorry, that action. Let, let me? Yeah. Does this normalization sort of depend on the energy being extensive in the system? Yes, it does. It actually does. It allows you. To. The answer is it's connected. This normalization can always be done. There's no, uh, there's, no um, there's no restriction in that. But this normalization, because um, it's like, you know, if you remember, just going back to black holes. The answer is yes. Um, if we went back to black holes, remember the energy of uh, Rind the Rindler energy of a black hole is proportion is just equal to its entropy, entropy over 2 pi or something. And the fluctuation in the energy, the square of the fluctuation in the energy is the same <coughs> thing. Whereas the fluctuation in the energy is the square root of the number of qubits. The energy is proportional to the number of qubits. And so the fluctuation in the energy is the same as or the energy itself. And that is important. That's equivalent to saying things are extensive. Well, uh, fluctuation is proportional to the square root of the number of degrees of freedom. That means you've normalized things so that things are extensive. So yes, the answer is uh, is, is connected. But um, okay, so the the idea is to normalize everything, including the metric in such a way that we can identify the complexity with the action, not the action of a quantum system, but the action of this classical, um, classical trajectory. As I said, it is equivalent to using the length of the, uh, of the geodesic, but it's a slightly different normalization of things. With this here, Make this assumption that we can, and we'll check it. We'll see if we'll see how well it works. Complexity is the action of the auxiliary classical system, and it's equal to the action of a non-relativistic particle. Sorry, there should be a half here, huh? Why is the half there? It's like one half mv squared. It's that half. Okay, so, good. Now, this quantity over here is Lagrangian, but it's also equal to the conserved energy, not the true energy of the quantum system, but the auxiliary, auxiliary energy of this classical, of this classical uh, analog system, classical auxiliary system. That's the A for auxiliary. Okay, so this is the kinetic energy. 
And how big should it be? This is conserved. Uh, we have to fix it. We have to fix it. And in fact, fixing this energy is equivalent to fixing the relationship between the action and the, um, and the length. That ratio is, I think, the square root of this energy, if I remember. OK, so how should we fix the energy of, um, of this fake classical particle moving on here? Well, I know something about complexity. I know that complexity as a function of clock time should grow at a rate equal to the number of qubits in the system. The number of gates per unit clock time, clock time, one unit of clock time, everybody gets to interact once. Apart from a factor of two, which I once traced down to this tube here, but I don't know how it works. The number of gates is essentially the same to within a factor of two uh, as the number of qubits themselves. Okay. Now, the rate of change of action is nothing but the Lagrangian, and the Lagrangian is nothing but the Hamiltonian, or nothing but the energy. Okay, so the rate of change of action should be k, should be the number of qubits. Therefore, Lenny, clock time is going to become regular time in the black hole picture. Right? In the black hole picture, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so um, that gives us a handle on normalizing the coefficient in front of the metric here. Sorry, so is there an obvious interpretation of what Schwarzschild time is going to end up meaning here? Uh, not here. Not here. Not here. <coughs> Not here. It's a good question. Uh, but, uh, yeah, oh, uh, um, not here. Okay. No, I don't think so. Okay, what does this metric look like, roughly? What does this metric look like? Now, I will assume now that not only near the origin of the section, but away from the origin of the section, that the sectional curvature, the correct sectional curvature, actually does maintain more or less a constant value equal to what was it, 1 over k. That's what we calculated the sectional curvature to be like, 1 over k. Let's suppose, all we really proved is that near the origin, it looks like a uniformly curved thing. Okay, let's, let's go further. And assume, therefore, that the metric has the form this is the metric on the, uh, on the complexities on the tangent spaces to the or the, to the, um, to the complexity metric. That it looks like VL squared is equal to some coefficient, or F squared, and then a hyperbolic plane. <coughs> VR squared or V tau squared, same thing, radial distance uh, plus um, cinch tau squared, V theta squared. I just use this as a stand-in for a uniformly curved metric. What we did in our calculation was to calculate the metric from uh, the complexity assumptions out to order t cubed. That's enough. That's, that's all we could do. I shouldn't say it's enough. It's all we were, we were able to do. And um, it had this form out to order t cubed. Let's assume that it more or less keeps going. Uh, F squared is basically 1 over the curvature squared. Uh, and um, yeah, let's, what say about this? And then, of course, the action will have a similar, a related form. It looks like some f squared out here. And then um, t squared. <laughs> oh boy. This t here, this is supposed to be a generic, this is supposed to be a generic negatively curved space. I should have written the r squared. Okay. Um, 
then the action would be r dot squared plus the theta, the theta terms. In other words, it's just f squared over 2 times the velocity squared, just non-relativistic motion. Non-relativistic motion as far as the radial component of the metric goes, just non-relativistic motion. And we just call this, it's basically 1 half mv squared. Okay, um, the f here, f squared is inverse to the curvature. So what we really want to write here is the curvature, let's see, the curvature is 1 over k, that means a k in the numerator here. Yeah. The curvature, do I have that right? Where does the curvature go in this metric? F squared is 1 over the curvature, right? right. F squared is 1 over the curvature. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that means f squared. That means k here if I want the curvature to be 1 over k, which is what I calculated. Yep. K here. Good. Okay. Now, if indeed it's true, let me put back here, this is uh, cinch squared r k squared. If it's true, or if it's normalized in such a way that action is equal to complexity, we know how fast complexity grows. Complexity grows at a rate k, k per unit Grindler time. That tells us that as we move away from the origin, the length or the action should grow, well, should grow like t, which tells us that r dot is equal to 1. That's equivalent to, um, to normalizing the energy so that it's equal to k. R dot is equal to 1. And so we have this negatively curved space. We're moving away from the center of it. And it's normalized in such a way that if you want to identify the growth of action with the growth of, the, uh, the growth of action with the growth of complexity, R dot should just be equal to 1. All right, that means that R is the Ringler time, or it grows like the Ringler time. On the other hand, if I look at this over here, this is growing exponentially with R, which means that it's growing exponentially with Ringler time. That's the separation of trajectories. And it's saying that the separation of trajectories is growing like e to the t, e to the tau. That's the up and up exponent. So the first thing to say is normalize the way I've normalized it. The Yapunov exponent governing the growth of chaos, or the growth of, in this case, just the growth of the separation of, uh, of the states. That Yapunov exponent is just one in Rindley units, which is equivalent to beta over two pi in, uh, uh, two pi over beta, two pi over beta in, uh, in Schwarzschild units. So we've normalized things in a way that's consistent with the growth of uh, complexity or the growth of operators. Uh, and it does require the coefficient down here to be k. Just again, because we want the action, uh, let, me, let me go through it again. If r dot is equal to 1, that will tell us that the separation is growing with the right Yapunov exponent. We can turn that around and say if the separation here is growing with the right Yapunov exponent, it tells us that r dot is equal to 1. Once r dot is equal to 1, we can fix this coefficient by saying the coefficient down here has to give us the rate of growth of complexity. The rate of growth of complexity is k gates per unit time, and that puts k out here, which says that the metric as curvature 1 over k, which is consistent with what we calculated from the, um, the Loschmidt-Deco uh, calculation. So those things fit. But um, let's talk about the relationship between this action and geodesic length. This is this connection between second order and first order formula, formalism. Um, Wait, Lenny, could you repeat? So the, the total energy that's fixed 
is, this is particle K. is order K. Is the total number of qubits in the system? Yeah, total number, number of qubits. qubits. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Which is also equal to the actual Rindler energy of the uh, quantum state, but I don't know what the, I don't know what the, the, uh, the argument would be there. Okay. If you go through it, if you go through it, um, normalizing the energy so that it is equal to K, and then working out the relation between geodesic length and action, the relation between first order and second order, you'll find that the action is equal to the square root of K times the geodesic length. Um, This square root of k is the only the only length scale in the metric. This thing here is one over the square root is, is the square root of k, or one over the square root of k. So this is the only length scale in the problem, and it's not too surprising that this is the way that it shows up. Okay, that length is action which is dimensionless over the square root of k. And you, you see that, that, that this is an elementary exercise just using the first and second order of Lagrangians and seeing that they're related by a factor of square root of k. Okay. So action then is equal to the square root of k times length. I want to give you an independent argument that I think it's completely independent, but it's interesting. The information theoretic argument uh, quantum information theoretic argument that complexity should also be the square root of k times the length on this complexity geometry. So let's see if we can make such an argument, and that would um, that would tie something that would tie things together and tell us we're using sensible normalization. Okay, so here's what we're doing. Sort of review what the picture is. When it, originally in Nielsen's approach, he assumed length is the complexity, right? That's yes. what he's like conjecture. Yes. But then now you're introducing this factor of square root of k. Yes. Okay. Yes. And Except that what Nielsen did, even with the way he even yes, but Nielsen wasn't really consistent. Using his rules, he would have got a curvature at the origin which was exponentially big. Okay. Now that would have been disastrous because he put infinite, uh, not infinite, but very high weight yeah, even right. on that like more right. than two or The effect of that, I'll show you what the effect of that would be. Here's two geodesics which are close to each other, which but which diverge. Mm -hmm. Now you start out here, way out here, you say, what's the ge minimum geodesic length between these two? Well, it sure doesn't look like this. Uh, the uh, the theta theta component of the metric is increasing, even if it's just not doubly exponential, to get that. Mm -hmm. It's increasing exponentially. So that means curves, you know, curves along from here to here will typically, if just drawn in some uh, naive way, will grow exponentially. And it's clearly a much more favorable strategy. That's to go back along, grow exponentially with time. Much more favorable strategy would just be to go back along here, go all the way back to the origin, and then go back here. That only takes time of time two t. Yeah. Okay. So that's a much shorter route. Okay. Much shorter route. Now, if you make your curve, if you make your space to have a certain curvature, then what you find is if you go way out. Yes, you will backtrack along here a certain way and then go back out like that. Where do you turn from going all the way back? Where do you turn? Where is the favorable place to turn to keep the smallest geodesic length? Not surprisingly, at, at the curvature radius. At the curvature radius. Nielsen's calculation gave an enormously large curvature, or essentially a zero curvature radius. So his prescription, or his geometry, would be such that you go all the way back and all the way here. What does that miss? It misses the switchback effect. It misses, the, it's not such a bad thing. I mean, he was mainly interested in this 
of finding bounds on, uh, on uh, like uh, gate complexity. Right? Yeah, gate complexity. Uh, it's not such a bad thing again. Right. What it would miss is the um, is the switchback effect, the switchback shortening of trajectory of geodesics, mm -hmm. because they don't have to go all the way back. Okay. So we put as basic data coming from both black holes and circuits and so forth that we have the switchback effect. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, uh, if you increase this uh, curvature radius to, if you increase the curvature to somehow to infinity, you see, you're going to basically simulate gate complexity. Did you say what? You did what? I mean, you're going to simulate gate complexity, and you get, you, you see the switchback effect in gates picture, so yeah. I, I would imagine then if you decrease the curvature radius to zero, you're still going to see the switch back, switch back effect because no. But because I mean you're gonna get closer and closer to gates picture, to picture of actual gates. What I'm saying is that making, as Nielsen's assumptions were not consistent with the gate picture. The gate picture tells you what does it tell you? It uh, tells you you should go back to the scrambling time and then turn around. And the scrambling time is a fairly long time. But, but you have a much, much more complicated space when you have many gates of acting in parallel. Yeah. So you have more dimensions. So somehow you, you, you get the cancellation in other dimensions. It's not a two-dimensional picture. So it's no, no, no. Yeah, you, good. Right. What I mean by this two-dimensional picture here is literally you take the two trajectories, which are separated by, let's say, a complexity one operator here, and then consider the actual geodesics connecting these and form a two-dimensional space from this. Right. Okay? What I'm saying is this two-dimensional space should not have an enormously large curvature. If it does, then you'll have to go all the way back. And what it's essentially saying, if it's very, very highly curved, is that these geodesics almost go all the way back and then go here. That's what large curves So then it mean. still can be consistent with uh, Nielsen's geometry, but you're saying that you the specific subspace that you're looking. The space spanned by two, uh, two Hamiltonians. Or the space that is appropriate for looking at a particular Hamiltonian, a particular, let's call it a shockwave operator, right? which is closely related to the, um, to the um, uh, Wolfschmidt operator e to the minus i h t e to the i h plus w t. They're not they're not the same thing, but uh, but they uh, they're, yeah 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 they're related. Okay, so Nielsen's penalty factor, which would make the curvature of this section, what it would do is it would require the geodesics to go almost all the way back. And as I said, that would miss the switchback uh, cancellation. But is, is my understanding correct that if you send the, uh, if you increase the curvature, say you send it to infinity, then you're basically going through this actual gates that you constructed your circuit, because you don't allow anything more than two gates. What? And in gates picture, I see the cancellation. <laughs> I think the point is that um, that trying to take the gate picture and replacing it with a continuum picture, you're gonna lose that. You're gonna lose it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That uh, that you do something bad when you try to punish all directions uh, to the same extent that the discrete gates would punish them. Now I don't I don't understand this completely, but that seems to be the case. That if you want to replace the discrete gate picture with a Hamiltonian picture, you have to allow for um, you have to allow for more complex objects. Than, uh, but you have to you have to weigh them and punish them. It seems to be the message here. That if you want to try to reflect all of the physics of the Hamiltonian, but capture also this uh, this idea of um, of switchback effect, 
that the trick for that seems to be not to punish three local operators and four local operators and five local operators with the ultimate punishment, but to make it more gradual. Now, this, I think, is really still work in progress. I don't think anybody, uh, I certainly don't uh, um, have anything like a rigorous understanding of it. So, but that seems to be what, uh, what's required. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's keep going. Uh, if the curvature is 1 over k, action will be related to length on that geometry by the square root of k. And if action is to be identified with complexity, this is a different action equals complexity uh, story than, yeah. uh, than, than the other one. Actually, can I ask a quick question about that? Yeah. It's, so this gives you also a relation to the action of, say, the wheel of the width patch. Well, to what extent this is the, this is related to the action of the wheel of the width patch? I don't know. Yeah. Is there any sort of like zero, like mini super priest approximation that could be used that sort of relates this to some particle? On my bucket list. Okay. I don't know. Uh, it seems very, very tempting to say that these two action equals complexity things must be simply related to each other, but I don't know how. So I'm not going to try to uh, push that. Not now. But it's not what totally I, crazy. What's that? It's not totally crazy. Seems crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I think about it though. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. Okay, so what we'd like to understand action equals square root of k times length. Action equals complexity. This is more of a question than anything. Do we have an independent argument, a complexity argument, let's call it, or a, a, just a pure quantum mechanics argument uh, for k local Hamiltonians and so forth, which would say that the complexity is equal to the square root of k times the length on, um, on this uh, length on SU2 to the k. Now, we're going to be talking actually about real trajectories generated by real Hamiltonians. We're talking about things along geodesics geodesics generated by real Hamiltonians, and real Hamiltonians means k-local Hamiltonians. For k-local Hamiltonians, here's our SU2 to the k, here's our origin, and the Hamiltonian will start moving you along here. If the Hamiltonian is k-local, then actually lengths along here will be the same as they are in the bi-invariant metric. Remember, we didn't punish the directions which are um, k local. So the length along a trajectory which is governed by a real k local Hamiltonian will be the same as it would be in the, uh, in the original SU2 to the k by local geometry. Geodesics which move in other directions which are not k local will not be the same on the two kinds of geometries, but we're not really interested in them. We're interested in actual motions governed by k-local Hamiltonians. So let's think about those. For those, as I said, the length along the complexity geometry and the length along the, uh, the standard um, bilocal geometry will be the same. So let's, let's use that. I want to normalize lengths along here. So here's the way I'll normalize them. What I mean incidentally by the um, by the bilocal geometry is the one which is given by du dagger du equals dl squared. With a coefficient one out here. It's the standard bilocal geometry on SUN. That, uh, that gives us a certain length along here. And for k-local motions, for motions which are long k-local directions, the length on the complexity geometry is the same as the length on the, um, on the uh, on bilocal geometry. OK, what's, how far can you move in the bilocal geometry before you come to an orthogonal state, an orthogonal unitary matrix? We start at the identity or any other place. It doesn't matter. 
and we move, and we ask how far do we move, how much length do we move before we come to a orthogonal U. Orthogonal with respect to what sort of product? Trace, uh, the trace product. With the trace being defined as the normalized trace. I think we wrote it down last time. Um, trace of the yeah. dagger V uh, yeah. is cosine of the angle, yeah. is cosine of the distance between them. Yeah. Well, the answer is distance pi over 2. Pi over 2 corresponds to becoming orthogonal along here. Um, so let's call the orthogonality distance L orthogonality equals pi over 2, which is of order 1. Order 1. Oops. Order 1. One unit of distance on the bilocal, on the bi-invariant metric, or, or along k-local directions brings you to an orthogonal configuration. Okay. Next question. Evolution by a Hamiltonian. How much, how long do you have to evolve the unitary matrix by in order that um, you generate a orthogonal unitary matrix? This is an uncertainty principle question. Uh, there's a bound, but the bound is usually pretty close to being saturated. It's not the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it's the delta E delta T kind of uncertainty principle. It's not the Margulis Leviton bound, it's the Aharonov Annenban bound, if you know what that is. Okay. It is, it is a statement of how much time it takes a system to evolve to an orthogonal state. Here we're talking about the <coughs> orthogonal unitary operators, but unitary operators represent states of, uh, of a pair of systems which are entangled, so you get to use this. How much time does it take to go from a state, um, sort of related to the question of how many gates uh, before you get sure that you get uh, uh, an orthogonal state? Anybody know the answer? Somebody look up? Well, I'll tell you the answer. The answer is pretty obvious in a sense. Delta T, we could call that the orthogonality time, amount of time. That's equal to 1 divided by delta E, where delta E is the uncertainty in the energy. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> now, what is a little bit surprising about this? Okay, this is this is uh, it, it's not surprising. <laughs> On the other hand, what is delta E? Now, by delta E, this means not the energy of this auxiliary classical system. It means the true quantum energy of the system. Okay, the true quantum energy of the system. Because I'm assuming there's some h bars there, right? There's an h bar, yeah. yeah. That's right. It's, it's the real quantum. Yes, there's an h bar. Is it upstairs or downstairs? Upstairs. Yes. Okay. Um, what is the uncertainty of the energy of this Cupid system? Well, it's been normalized in such a way that delta, that delta E squared is K. That normalization, incidentally, is the basic normalization that goes into normalizing the J's in SYK. That the uncertainty, and this is also a black hole thing, that the uncertainty in the energy of a black hole is the square root of the number, uh, square root of the entropy. Uh, <coughs> okay. So um, here's the conclusion. Delta T is one over K. Square root. Square root. Square root. One of the square root. Of K. Here. One of the square root. Of K. Now. Now here's where I constantly get confused by this argument. This is the place I get stuck every single time. I've done this a hundred times, and in fact I did it less than an hour ago, but I forgot how it was. Okay, let's see if I remember. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. No. What? Why do I care about delta t? I forgot. Yeah, we were asking about the length. Like I want to know how many gates it takes you till you become orthogonal. Ah. It's kind of just one gate, right? So no. No. No, square root of k. Oh, oh, here's the other No, no, that's one. the time. You need one gate to match the time square root. Yeah. How many gates do you get per unit time? You get k gates per unit time. Mm -hmm. All right. So on a time of order one over square root of right, k, you get like square right. root of k gates. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Now this is surprising. All right, good. That's that was the point. Um, a, this is the amount of time to become a father. <coughs> but we expect that the rate at which gates are being laid down is k. Mm -hmm. So that means the number of gates between here and an orthogonal point is itself square root of k square root of k gates. Is that a little bit surprising? It surprised me, but um, I, I would have thought that one gate, and it's, it, it's true, if I take a random state or a, a fairly random state and put down one count. gate, and then Sandu Papescu thought about it a little bit, and he made a very convincing argument that that is not really true, that as you lay down gates one after another, they tend to cancel and they tend to cancel in the complexity. Uh, and, and they tend to cancel and don't lead to, to orthogonal states. And his argument, this, his argument was, this is his argument, incidentally. Sandro Popescu was the one who made the argument that said that the number of gates to get orthogonal on the average was square root of k. It's a statistical thing. But if I just um, take a spin chain and I flip one, like I, I, I'm, I'm happy with sort of doing this over a while and seeing gates cancel. But if I just do a single one, I do just get a orthogonal state. If you're a thinking, true discrete gate, mm -hmm. but then the next gate will probably take you back. It also That's seems to depend on the entanglement of the yeah. state. So like if you think of a spin chain yeah. state, a product state, you do a unitary shirt, it makes it orthogonal. Oh, oh, oh. But if you think about yeah. The, the inner product of psi and u psi for some local u that ends up being like, if, if the reduced density matrix on the region that you're applying u has full rank, then there isn't even going to be a unitary. If you have sufficient entanglement, there won't be a unitary that you can do locally to make the state orthogonal. I'm not sure that's true. I'm not sure. But um, the uh, the end and then a hard enough bound. Like that will not spike that much otherwise. Anyway, we're sure that this is correct. Uh, it's the square root of so. Okay, so to go one orthogonality distance takes the square root of k gates, but one orthogonality distance is just a distance equal to order one. Okay, so what does that tell us? To go a distance l takes square root of k times l gates. That's the same as this. So action equals square root of k times length. That follows from the curvature being 1 over k, as calculated by looking at the uh, complexity method. Curvature, sorry, um, complexity equals square root of k times L. That follows from the Harnock and that bound. And this equals this. It's just a consequence of the equality of the right hand sides. So there's there's a structure here. There's clearly a structure here. Um, the motion of a complexity geometry, a motion on that complexity geometry. These I think are the important things that we sort of know. Motion of a complexity geometry, the notion of a motion on the complexity geometry. Uh, governing the evolution of unitaries or the evolution of states, that the action associated with that motion scales the same way as the complexity. And beyond that, um, is of course something of a conjecture, 
that something like gate complexity, which is a very definite thing, and, you know, gates are discrete things and so forth, that gate complexity uh, reflects the same thing. One other element, the other element is that the curvature being 1 over square root of k, or 1 over k, uh, is also consistent with the scaling of the Apennine exponent. The Apennine exponent uh, will scale the right way with the curvature being 1 over k. I think there's a structure there, and it's a structure that um, has uh, not, not been explored. So, uh, is it worth exploring it? For sure it is. Some decent definition of complexity, I think, uh, will revolve around these things. But um, is, it, uh, is it necessarily the way forward to understand why the electron to proton mass ratio was 1800? Well, maybe. No, it's proton to electron. How much physics is in this? Hard to know. How much complexity theory is also hard to know. But there is a structure there, and I'm pretty sure the structure is a, is a real thing. So, anybody who's interested, I will tell you what, what I know about it. Any questions about any of this? I'm a little bit confused about the yeah, why in a order of one length we become orthogonal in the complexity metric. Like along, these are along k local directions. Along k local directions, the length is the same as it would be for ah, a phi invariant. Right? So it would be like as in a phi invariant case. So right. there, I understand why it's there. Understand one there, distance. you understand okay. why it is. And, and then, and then we know that we need square root of k complexity to get to the orthogonal right. average. Right. So, so because the complexity. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And. That, uh, that uh, links these two statements together. Complexity, again, equals action. Now, whether this action is in any way related to the Einstein action or the other complexity equals action, I'd like to believe so. Uh, people have even written papers saying so, but I don't think they made much sense. But uh, 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 that would be very nice, but I don't, I don't see the connection. Probably the place to look for it is in SYK. Um, the, uh, all of this applies in SYK, and it applies, mo it's the most simple example. Uh, complexity collection. is more or less, hmm? complexity is more or less easy to study. Right? Like it's more or less easy to study, but, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> But in particular, the, the process, of the calculation of the um, of the negative curvature, that's easy in SYK. Mm -hmm. It's easier in SYK than it is with qubits. And again, that same four thirds appears. That same um, uh, that when the third, yeah. well, when the first non-trivial punishment factor takes over, if it's bigger than four thirds, then space is negatively curved. All of that is the same. And um, it certainly looks like that would be the place to try to, uh, to nail some of these things. Qubits are too complicated. So fermions are much simpler. So there you said that we basically use the disorder average to talk about this uh, sort of variance in the energy. It's the same as the variance of the change. Yes. But generally, I would assume that I have some fixed Hamiltonian. Right? So, I mean, that. that yeah. It seems like a quite different story. There, there we expect that the sort of variance in the energy is that it's a quantum mechanical sort of uncertainty in the energy, or where, where would that delta E come from in that case? This I guess delta I just don't e, know this, this delta E, let's see, um, where, why delta E is square root of K? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, okay, that I think is true for SYK, and I think it's true for any kind of K-local Hamiltonian. Now, is it more true? But that's a variance no, with respect to this, think, um, to the J average, right? right? I mean, it's normalization for it's J, normalization but there's a physical J. reason it's a normalization. for this normalization, right? The normalization of J that's used, I don't know what the, I know what my argument for the normalization uh, is. It was to reproduce the fluctuations in the energy of a black hole, mm -hmm. which are of order the square root of the entropy. The fluctuations in the Rindler energy are of order the square root of the entropy. 
and that's more or less a picture of it is that, uh, that the system is a bunch of independent qubits uh, and uh, each random and therefore the total fluctuation in the energy is the square root of the number of qubits. And that's of course not what's really going on in SYK. They're not a bunch of independent, they're a bunch of couple of qubits. The normalization that's used though is the same as saying the fluctuation in the energy is equal to the square root of the, uh, the number of qubits. What's the, what's the argument that goes into that? Um, Doesn't it also make the energy extensive? Okay. Energy what? Extensive. Well, it does, but why should the energy? Yes, that's exactly yeah, no, right. Yeah. But yeah. why should the energy be? This is something that, that like, Devin yeah. and I have discussed. Like, it's uh, sort of unclear. Yeah, the normalization that's used in these SYK kind of arguments is such that the energy is extensive and that the energy fluctuation is extensive. That's a property of black holes. Why it uh, why you should do that? Somehow I think it has a smooth large end limit, but I don't know what the argument is. What do they say? Yeah, I actually don't know. Yeah, yeah those those are the arguments I've read about in like spin glass papers. They like we need to kick this scaling for the Hamiltonian to be extensive in system size. Okay, why? But no. where, where did it start? <laughs> But those spin glass like papers thing. are based on, on k local, non local Hamiltonians. Yeah, like yeah. Like an overall coupling with like some like spins. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So um, I don't know what the argument is for spin glasses. Yeah. I do know what the argument is if you want to match black holes. Yeah, so, so that, that I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and what the argument is in SYK? It's to match black holes. I mean, because. Is it? Is it? Probably because you want to start, to, you want to find whether the thermal stir in SYK. Describes a black hole, right? That was oh, of course, that's the goal. yeah, that was the goal. Of course, of course. But then I don't know if there's any other like large end justification for it. I thought it might there was be. something there about is. normalizing yeah. uh, two point function. Yeah, some sort of diagram in the two point function. Yeah, and requiring uh, that it has a large end limit. Yeah, yeah, Phil explained it to me somehow. I don't yeah. remember, but like. You yeah, get an end upstairs and right. some end downstairs. There is some two point answer. function if you calculate it and then require that it has a large end limit. Uh, but you know, you can ask why should it have a large end limit? Why can't it go like into the one half or in the but if you require that a certain two so point you can do a large end limit, yeah. then it uh, it reproduces the same scaling. Um, Last week Andy Lucas also gave a talk and yeah. there the justification for the normalization for many models actually to be extensive is that that's what makes the fast <coughs> scrambling conjecture generic. That's true. what makes what? Fast scrambling generically true. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah sure, true. sure. And so, if you believe that that's something important, I mean, because you know his yeah, point yeah, was no, it's the same as it's the same as normalizing the time. Yeah, exactly. Time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, normalizing the Hamiltonian is normalizing the time. Yeah. And if you want the fast scrambling to come out the right way, then it's got to be normalized that way. Yes. So basically, like in a unit time, you need to have n gates. Like being applied. That's right. That's the, unit like time, the unit sort of time you have to have in gates. Like in any model. Right. And in that, in that sense, the number of gates that's being applied is, is extensive. And, uh, but one might argue that fast scrambling is more sort of intrinsic than like normalizing a two point function or just yeah. you know, making things and like nice more and calculation. Time. Yeah. And the argument is? When you say fast scrambling, you're talking about now with a particular coefficient out front. Well, a coefficient that doesn't vary wildly with the uh, yeah, with the, the log sort of, yeah. yeah, a universal coefficient. Yeah, yeah. it's true. But, um, yeah, if you just dropped yeah. a charge onto a black hole in terms of Schwarzschild time, it would it would basically diffuse in order like the crossing time. Now, if I think about yeah. in Schwarzschild mm -hmm. time, in Schwarzschild time. It takes uh, short shield radius crossing time times log s. Okay, I thought I thought all that log s was from the sort of uh, the different. Okay, it depends. Um, it depends. Okay, good. How do you define the charge on the horizon? You go down the surface to yeah. the horizon, and you look at the orthogonal. Components of the electric field. Yeah, exactly. How close to the horizon do you go? 
So the answer is, if you went to a distance which was classical, classical means a numerical multiple of the Schwarzschild radius, then what you say would be true. If you go down to a quantum distance, like an L Planck stretch direction, something like that, let's say, then it will have this logarithm of s. Oh, so that's pretty important. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, anything that has an S in it is always quantum mechanical. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. right. So if you define the location on, uh, of the horizon as being quantum mechanical in that sense, then it is <coughs> as an extra log S. Okay. Uh, that was the original scrambling argument. Um, And the other element of it is that k-local Hamiltonians normalized the way you said, normalized so uh, uh, with standard normalization will be fast scramblers. Uh, so there's a lot of little pieces which seem to fit together into some kind of picture of a complexity geometry, uh, negatively curved. Now the interesting thing about being negatively curved um, is that trajectories tend to separate and be, can behave chaotically. Does that mean that quantum chaos can be thought of as more or less the same as classical chaos except with an exponentially larger number of degrees of freedom? Yeah. I think so. Uh, yeah, and effectively maybe you can describe interesting things in the subspace of these directions, right? Which is much less of them. There's yeah. not exponentially many of them. Right. Just polynomial. Polynomial. Yeah. So, so this is what I think will be most interesting chaotic directions. The other thing I'll talk about a little, not next time, we'll do something else next time, but uh, the time after that. The, the last thing I think is to try to make a case that in this um, dynamical system that's describing the actual quantum evolution of unitary operators or state vectors, that, that the dynamics or the statistics of it is such that what we call complexity is essentially entropy. Okay. That I think is a, uh, an important thing in trying to understand the long time growth of complexity and, uh, and what its connection uh, with um, thermalization is. We want to argue that after a long time, of course, complexity is likely to settle into its maximum value and fluctuate around uh, for doubly exponential times. We want to argue that's basically the thermalization of this, of this, this kind of system. Yeah. And for that, we need an argument that says complexity is like entropy. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little more. But what are the fluctuations coming from there? Like, so oh. What are the uncertainty? Like this is. This you mean how big are the fluctuations? Um, what well, sort of? For the entropy or for complexity? So on this space, I mean, just if I take just a, a quantum mechanical system with a particular Hamiltonian, then everything is perfectly deterministic, just because the U's obey the Schrodinger equation, yes. so sort of, right? And you might ask, sort of like, you know, if I'm talking Everything's about deterministic, these, absolutely, right? Like, it's, it's so it's classical ask, statistical mechanics. But what are sort of the macroscopic variables that are sort of consistent with some microscopic? Like what are the sort of different trajectories? I think, I think the main macroscopic variable is the complexity itself. And we're allowing ourselves to sort of change the Hamiltonians a bit? Because that's basically what you do, right? You sort of we'll have a little perturbation. Let's say we're allowed to have any k-local Hamilton. That corresponds to the different initial trajectories. Yeah, exactly. So um, there's some features of the distribution of initial velocities that would correspond, for example, to an average energy. Yeah, I, I guess my question is sort of why do you average over some Hamiltonians in the quantum system? Like why, oh, makes why do I just think easy. of a single <laughs> Hamiltonian and a single path? Like why, why do, do I think of a family of Hamiltonians? <laughs> why do you do that? With the hopes that uh, they all have similar behavior for some subset of questions. And that you can just average and reproduce the, uh, the generic 
the averaging reproduces the generic, and that the generic covers a wide uh, yeah. fraction of the possibilities. Okay. So, in yeah. that sense, right. um, and it's still not obvious, right? That if the average complexity grows uh, to the exponentially late times linearly, it's still not clear if you took a simple, like one, like generic one, it will still continue growing. That's right. But but it's it's I think it's good enough for like as a like toy problem. Okay, what are the things which we know behave that way? That uh, they self-average in this way. Do we really know that about anything in the? That's what I mean. Yeah. Any quantity. Let's say that's what I mean. What uh, what quantities are we quite sure? I think like two point about? functions. What's the uh, argument that they? Uh, those sort of y quench disorders. Yeah, so like average. averaging uh, over j's yeah, is yeah. the same as a generic Hamiltonian yeah. index behavior. Yeah. See, I mean, nobody's really no. calculated like in a rigorous. I sense, actually like, don't know what the argument yeah. is. Yeah. Um, this, this is probably some cases where it doesn't know, but uh, yeah. I don't know what they are. Why are you allowed to average and then say that the average uh, reflects the the properties and which properties of uh, the vast majority of instances? I think basically the sort of glass story is all these sort of uh, little defects in your material are completely uncorrelated, roughly, so that if I look at one per particular instantiation of, say, some defects in the system, and I look at a patch, okay, and now I want to study the physics of a yeah. patch. It looks like in the patch, there's sort of a distribution of defects as well. So if I sort of disorder average before or after, the, 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 that shouldn't really matter. Okay, that wasn't a good explanation. I don't know what you mean. Well, I would think like, that sort of if you have a big enough system, like a, a system, then you'll find a bit of everything anywhere. So yeah, that's, no, what that's, that's, that's basically what I'm trying to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. A chunk, roughly, yeah, yeah. central area. That simple. would be averaging over space is averaging over disorder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about these k-local systems that are uh, not uh, that are not spatially local? What's the argument there? For subsets. Mm -hmm. I mean, averaging over space is like averaging over subsets here. But they all talk to each other. But they all yeah, talk yeah, to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what the argument is. So, yeah, I don't think that's a good argument, actually. Oh, that's a good point. But <laughs> are you talking specifically about SYK? Because I thought that Maldus and Stanford actually computed some like fluctuation between Maybe they did. different replicas in their paper. Yeah. Okay, so, that, that's the kind of thing you'd like to do. And show that it goes over like one over size. You, you want to so, show some so kind of concentration result. Mm -hmm. You want to show some kind of concentration result, and I guess they. I don't think they have something that's wrong. I think they just show fluctuations or something, which is like, I mean, concentration is usually. Yeah, like I mean, fluctuation is small. Right? It's probably means that you have concentration. Right? But that, that's I mean, different than self-averaging, right? Lenny's question is about. No, no, it's, it's the same. Like yeah. if, if you have the quantity, you can average over the ensemble and then uh, find what is the variance, right, of the quantity if you do. Sure. Then show that it's like small, like it gets much smaller with n. Like, oh, okay. the system. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm like, this would be like a like, more rigorous way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm not. Like, so I don't know if it's like yes. that rigorous way down the time. I mean, so I don't know the status of that, but. Um, I, I tend to trust the uh, uh, friends who say it. I don't know why. <laughs> so spatial averaging being the same as ensemble averaging, that I understand. Yeah, that, that, that was all I was saying. Uh, right. And then it's a sort of artifact that you normalize the Hamiltonian so that it looks like it's extensive. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, SYK kind of situation, um, so you say subsets of things, uh, but I don't know what you're really legitimate. I don't know. Yeah, the subsets are interacting with their environments a lot, but the environments sort of all look the same or something. Yeah, yeah. maybe there's yeah. some sort of mean field thing. Wow. Well, Didn't Phil talk about this? Probably. <laughs> yeah, probably not the right <laughs> so, guy. Last time. Yeah. so what can we do next week? Richard. Is it Richard? Richard is